Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see you this morning. Welcome to those that are here with us in the sanctuary or here with us in the Fellowship Hall or with us joining us online. Great to have each of you here. Definitely uh, see a number of some familiar faces, but faces that I haven't seen for a little while. Uh, we've got faces from Colorado. We've got faces from Arizona. We've got faces from Maine. Uh, great to have you folks with us today. And we've got some faces that are not here today uh, because they're on family vacations and things. And hopefully they're able to join us online or be able to worship the Lord wherever they're at today. So good to be with you today. I'm going to have Michael come on up here. I didn't give him a heads up. But uh, Michael Butler was approved by our local board of administration to be a covenant member of the Wesleyan Church on Tuesday night. And so we'd just like to welcome him into full membership into the Wesleyan Church. Congratulations, Michael. You take a quick look at the bulletin, uh, just a, a, some encouragement. If you're a first-time guest visitor with us, stop by the Connection Center on your way out today. We do have a gift that we'd like to give to you, just our way of saying thanks for being with us in worship today. You can also fill out an online Connect card if you are joining online. There are a couple announcements I want to highlight. Uh, one, the money for the Loons game is due today. If you could help us out with that, or at least you get signed up if you want to go. Uh, we'll count that you're good for the money, but we're definitely looking to finalize our numbers for the tickets uh, this week, beginning of the week, and so if you could help us out with that, that would be great. Also, next Sunday, we will have Anthem, trio from Kentucky Mountain Bible College that will be with us for the morning service. They're going to be uh, taking about half of the service, and I look forward to having a great time singing some probably some older hymns and some different choruses and probably some newer things that they're going to share with us and a great time of worship together. There will be a free will offering for them next Sunday. I want to give you a heads up. If you want to just write the check, you can go ahead and write it to Kingston Wesleyan Church and just on the memo line, put KMBC and we'll make sure that that goes together, that they get one check from us that they can take back to the school and just to, we can help cover their traveling expenses and things along that, well, along that line. That would be great. I, I want to also say I love seeing, I heard a little one, and I just want you guys to know you, you're welcome to have the little ones in here. I love seeing the little ones in here. If you feel a need to take them out, I think Grandma just took out one of them. The nursery is available if you want to be able to, to go in there. There is a TV screen, and so you can follow along with the service if you like. Um, but I just want you to know from, from me, I love seeing little ones in the service. Um, hopefully the older ones, you, you don't mind me saying this, but I love seeing them more than I love seeing anybody else. <laughs> Other than my wife and daughter, I will say, okay? Well, we are in a series called The Gift, and before I jump into the series, um, it's somebody's birthday today, and I would maybe ask them to lead us, but since it's their birthday, I wouldn't feel like that would be right. It is Larry's birthday today. Would you guys join me in singing happy birthday? It, it, don't let this be a solo. Don't let this be a solo. I'll get you started. Happy birthday to you. What's that? It's not my, it's not my birthday today. It it will be. Let's not, we, we're not getting ahead of ourselves. Fifties <laughs> coming soon. Let's not let's not rush things too too much. And just so you know, it, fifty is not this year. Okay, I don't want anybody thinking I said something I, that yeah. You know. <clears throat> Your, your uh, memory is one of the first things you lose. I don't remember what else is on the list, but... Um, couple gifts. Larry, I don't know if... But I came across these gifts before, before I knew it was your, your birthday and, and realized and, and things. So I can't say that I had you in mind 
for these gifts. Uh, Michael, if you help me out and put it up on the, the big screen. Um, I don't know if this is a gift. Anybody want to say, like, hey, that gift, th- I think I would appreciate this gift. I, or I know somebody that would appreciate this gift. A- anybody say, I need that gift? Nobody? That's, that's where I was at. Like, that looks like just too much, too much exercise to me. Just bouncing up and down to make it go down the road. Like, yeah, that looks like too much to me. Um, I, I wouldn't say I need that. How about this one? This is a mood ring, toilet ring. Anybody say, yeah, I know somebody that would appreciate that. Now I know what to get them for their birthday or for Christmas. Can you imagine walking in after somebody? Like, oh, so they're happy now. <laughs> or that must have been really painful. I, you know, like, <laughs> that just, I, I don't know. Anybody say, like, anybody say, I need that? Anybody's like, who would want that? When, when, we, when we talk about the gift, and if you weren't with us last week, we are in the book of John. If you go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn to John chapter 15. We've been walking our way through the book of John. We're in a two-week mini-series in the book of John, looking at the gift that Jesus spoke of. The Word of God says that the Son of God has a gift for us called the Spirit of God. Sadly, I think sometimes our approach, even those in the church, their approach to this amazing gift is to look at the Holy Spirit kind of like we look at this these two gifts that I've just shown you. Like, "Mm, I don't know that I'd really appreciate that. I don't know that I really need that gift in my life right now. Thank you very much. And so we just kind of dismiss the gift or we don't pay attention to the gift, the Holy Spirit. Before we look at John chapter 15, I want to share again what I shared last week. Helps give us some foundation. We sang the song, We Believe, last week, and uh, some of you got really into it, and it was great to see. We talked about, well, we believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and is of the same essential nature, majesty, and glory as the Father and the Son, truly and eternally God. We talked about the Trinity, the importance of understanding that we believe as an Orthodox church, we believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. Three distinct persons in the Godhead important part of theology. I did not share this last week, but this is also part of the denomination's statement as far as understanding the the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit, is the administrator of grace to all and is particularly the effective agent in conviction for sin, in regeneration, in sanctification, and in glorification. He is ever-present, assuring, preserving, guiding, and enabling the believer. Now, there are some words on here that are bigger words and some words that are possible that you don't have a lot of understanding, and that's okay because they're not words that most people use on a regular basis, and they're not even words that we would use necessarily a whole lot in the church, but just a a quick understanding. I think most people would understand conviction, and we'll talk more about conviction as we go along, because Jesus is going to talk about the Holy Spirit convicting, and he's going to talk about sin, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. He doesn't talk about regeneration, but regeneration is the idea of new life, and we get new life in Christ, and we understand through Scripture that the Holy Spirit is the one that, that exercises or that brings that new life within us, that we are new creations. 
in Christ Jesus. And that that is a work of the Holy Spirit. That we are not who or what we were. That we've been made new. Regeneration. In sanctification, the idea of being set apart. This continual process of becoming more and more set apart, being made holy to the Lord. Sanctification. Cleansing. And then glorification, which ultimately takes place when we enter into heaven and we can sin no more and we become the glory to the Father that we were created to be. All of these things that the Holy Spirit works and does in us, but then we also see a very practical side to the Holy Spirit and what He does in our lives, that He's ever-present, He is assuring, He's preserving, He's guiding and enabling the believer. And that is much of what we will see as we look at John chapter 15, the last couple verses, and then the first 16 verses of chapter 16. Again, I hope you have your Bibles with you. I will have it up on the screen, but I, I do think there's just something about being able to have it in front of you, whether it's in um, a regular hardback or, or softback Bible or a Bible app on a, on a cell phone or a tablet. However you want to engage in God's Word, definitely encourage you to do so. Page 764, if you're grabbing one of the KWC Bibles and want to follow along there. When the Advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. I've highlighted a few words. I'm not going to spend a long time on them, but I do want to address things, make sure we're all on the same page as we go through this passage together. If you're reading in another translation, you may see a different word than advocate. You may see the word counselor. You may see the word comforter. You may see the word helper. There are some other words that could be used as well. There's at least one translation that uses the word friend. Intercessor could also be used. It's the Greek word parakletos. And there are different ways to pronounce it, and I'm not Greek, and I didn't take Greek, so I can't give you the like, most definite one. Pastor Brian probably could, but he's on vacation, so we're not going to ask him to do that today. But it's the idea of one who is called to come along beside. And Jesus said last week, as we looked at John chapter 14, that he's going to Ask the Father to send the comforter, the advocate, the counselor, the friend, the one who is to come beside and that he would come and be with us, but he would also be in us. And so we talked about that the most important thing to remember is that the gift, the Holy Spirit, is not an it. It's a person one of the Godhead. The advocate come from the Father. The spirit of truth. Everybody say truth, please. The spirit of truth. And so he's going he's gonna to teach us truth, but he's also going to guide us in truth. We'll see that as Jesus continues to talk about the Holy Spirit. And he says one of the main things that he will do is that the Holy Spirit will testify about Jesus, which is interesting because one of the words that parakletos can be translated in some translations, get this, is counselor, which is the idea of not necessarily Bob Newhart sitting or, you know, in a chair or having somebody sit on a, lay on a couch or whatever, but a legal counsel, giving directions and asking questions, helping us to understand where we're at as it relates to the law. And that the Holy Spirit will testify on behalf of Jesus. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. That's what we'll see as we continue to look at Scripture. Chapter 16, verse 1. All this, which you kind of have to pause because Jesus is saying, all this I have told you. Well, what's all this? We're not going to go into all of it. But basically, two essential things. 
One, he's going to die. He's going to die soon. This is his, the last supper, the last time, last few hours that they're going to be spending together. And so Jesus has been taking time that evening preparing them for his departure. Preparing them mentally, emotionally. This is what's coming up. There's going to be some really rough days. I'm going to die. You guys are going to be scattered. Somebody's going to betray me. All of you are going to deny me. Things are going to be bad. You, you guys are going to end up being persecuted. Things are going to be bad, but there's also some good news. One, I'm going away to, to prepare a place for you so that you can be where I am. But I'm also going to send a gift to you that will help you day by day, minute by minute. So there's some bad news and some good news. And I love that Jesus does this with the disciples because Jesus is all about truth. He's all about reality. He's not trying to paint a rosy picture when things are, were going to be really, really hard. But he also gives them some hope. And this is one of the things when I look at having marriage counseling, like the importance of understanding that marriage is awesome, but it's not always easy. And there are oftentimes going to be times in a couple's life where they may get to a point of like, I just want to bail. Because relationships can be really hard, really difficult. But to hang in there, I'm not going to paint a, a rosy picture and make it all look like it's, it's easy because it's not easy. My wife will tell you that. But it's worth it, especially if you'll do things right. And so Jesus is giving them a, a very clear heads up. Things are going to be rough, but keep this in mind. Heaven is waiting for you. And keep this in mind. I won't leave you alone. One who is like me, another one, one who is like me, the Holy Spirit will come to you. So Jesus goes on, he says, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. It's interesting that some of the worst things that happen, happen in the name of God. So some of the worst things that happen to the people of God are done in the name of God by people that don't really know God. They think they're doing the right thing. They think they're honoring God. But either they don't really know God or they don't know the heart of God. And they end up hurting others. And Jesus has given them a heads up. This is going to happen to you. We'll talk more about that as we actually go back into chapter 15 in the next couple weeks. We'll look at love and hate. Next week we'll look at love and then we'll look at hate because Jesus said there are those that are going to hate you. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's important that we get comfortable with the understanding that there are going to be people that will hate us. We don't want them to hate us. We're not trying to do things to intentionally cause people to hate us, but people will hate us. And so we'll look at that in two weeks and what is our response? What is the Christ thing to do? We'll look at that as we go into that text in a couple weeks. Verse 3, they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asked me, where are you going? They did ask that earlier, but that's been figured out. More than that, they weren't completely asking, like, what's going to happen to you? How are you going to die? And, and asking more of the questions, and even more so asking, why? But rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. Verse 7, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Now, I don't know about you, but as I read this, and if I am putting myself in the shoes of one of the disciples, I'm thinking, what are you talking about, Willis? Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, huh? It's good that you go away? No, I think it's good that you stay with me. 
Like you walk on water, you make the blind to see, the lame to walk, you've healed the dead. I, I think I want you with me. How many of you would say you think it would be better for Jesus to be right with you? Like, doesn't that sound pretty good? Like, to be able to go through the day like, Jesus, what do I do now? Jesus, can you help me out with this? Jesus, I'm struggling. My back's really hurt. Like, if Jesus was right there, that, I think that'd be pretty awesome. But Jesus says, it is for your good that I'm going away. Because unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me. I want to just pause here and just say it's good. Jesus is telling the disciples and telling us it's good that he go away, that the Holy Spirit can come. And there's two different ways that we can understand why it's good that Jesus go away and that we have the Holy Spirit. One, when Jesus came to earth, he took on flesh. He was in one place at a time. He wasn't walking with all of the disciples if they were in different spots. He was, he was at the well when they went to buy some stuff. Like There were times when Jesus wasn't with them where the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is spirit, because the Holy Spirit is God, he's omnipresent, he can be everywhere at the same time. That's good news. Because we all need the Holy Spirit all the time, and we're not always together, right? So that's good news. But I think another part of this that is important for us to understand, because the God had, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit is not the Father and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, they have different responsibilities, different traits. They work and interact in, with humanity in different ways. The Holy, the, Jesus the Son came to die on the cross for our salvation the Holy Spirit's going to testify and point us to that truth. The Holy Spirit works in ways that Jesus does not work because the Holy Spirit is different than Jesus. They're the same in majesty, in glory. They're holy, they're omnipresent, they're omniscient, they all, they're all-knowing. All of the characteristics that make God God is true for God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But they have different roles. And Jesus is saying, I've done my role. Now you need the Holy Spirit because he has a role to play in your life. And he wants people to believe about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Verse 14, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Here's the big idea that I want to capture, and then we'll look at three things, three ways that the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Number, uh, or just the, the big idea, the Holy Spirit works for your good and God's glory. It is for your good, Jesus said, that the Holy Spirit come, that Jesus go, that the Holy Spirit come. It's for your good. The Holy Spirit works for our good. So it's important that we understand that this gift is for our good. It was mentioned that I do have a birthday coming up, and since it was mentioned, I just let you know, I wouldn't mind having a convertible Mustang. 
If somebody just said, like, the Lord lays that on your heart, I'm not, I'm not trying to, like, you know, make you feel like you need to do it. But if the Lord lays that on your heart, I would love to have, like, a convertible Mustang. And you know what? I'd be okay if it's not a convertible. I'd be okay if it's not actually a Mustang. If it's, you know, if it's a hot rod Camaro, you, you know, like one of the Dodges with the, with the Hemi in it. Anything that goes vroom, vroom, you know, like fast and, and makes good noise. Like, I'd be happy to have that. How many of you think it would be good for me to have like a convertible Mustang or Camaro? I see Paul Rice shaking and... <laughs> Well, have you seen me drive, Paul? I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he lives on a house that I drive by different times during the week. And, okay, maybe I'm going speed limit-ish as I go by. Okay, I have a little bit of a heavy foot. If I had a hot rod, I'm pretty sure I'd find myself getting into, I, I'd probably get into trouble. So would it be good for me to get that gift? No. So, you know what? I don't expect that the Lord is going to give me a hot rod. Kind of like the guy that I heard talking about going out golfing. He's like, Lord, please help me to, to shoot a really low score today. He's going out with some friends that were decent golfers, and he, he shot the worst game, like, ever since he had basically started golfing. He hadn't shot that, that bad in years. And he got back, and he's like, what, what, what in the world? And felt like the Lord basically said, you, you need humility and patience more than you needed a low score today. The Holy Spirit will work for our good. It's important that we keep in mind that it's for our good because there are times when things may not go the way we want them to go, but to keep in mind that the Holy Spirit works for our good, simultaneously, he also works for God's glory, for God's glory. So to keep these things in mind. Now let's look at the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And, and you're probably noticing that we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. And that's the way that it is when you use technology. Sometimes technology is awesome and you love it. How many of you love technology? And how many of you love technology when technology works right? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes computers like have their own idea of what they're going to do so anyway at least you can hopefully follow along with what i have on the middle one number one the holy spirit convicts the holy spirit convicts and as i said just a little bit ago the holy spirit works for our good and for god's glory and when we think of conviction we don't oftentimes think of it as a good thing but i want you to know that conviction, Holy Spirit conviction, is absolutely a good thing. The Holy Spirit helping us to see our own sin is a very good thing. The gospel is called the good news. It's important that we understand that there is no good news without some bad news. The bad news is that you and I are sinners that we have sinned, that we have gone our own way, that we have chosen to not walk in obedience with God. And the Holy Spirit convicts about sin. He convicts about righteousness. We're, we're not righteous. We might think we're righteous. We might think, well, we're pretty good people. But then when we get in comparison and we understand the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, that Christ walked this earth without sin, we go, oh, okay, I'm convicted. I'm guilty. And then we understand the third thing that Jesus said the Holy Spirit helps us to see, sin and then righteousness and then judgment because we're not righteous on our own apart from Christ, that we're deserving of judgment. And the kind of the case closed that the Holy Spirit presents is that when Christ was crucified, Satan was forever condemned declared guilty, 
defeated. Satan will be held accountable for his sin. Just like everyone else is held accountable for their sin. And so the Holy Spirit wants us to see these truths. And so the Holy Spirit convicts. But the Holy Spirit also has another part, another work that he does. He convinces he comes alongside, doesn't just convict us about our sin, but convinces us that there is a remedy for that sin, that we would believe in Jesus Christ. And so he continues to point our attention and call us and draw us to the cross of Christ so that we would receive forgiveness, that we would understand that, yes, we're a sinner, but our Savior offers grace, offers forgiveness. And so he looks to convince us of the truth. You're a, you're a sinner, and Christ died for you. Here's the truth, the Spirit testifies. Those that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's the truth, the Spirit testifies. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The Spirit speaks the truth, the Spirit testifies <laughs> you are mine you're my child the spirit testifies truth I love that the word of God tells us that the spirit of God testifies to our spirit that we are children of God that assurance and what great assurance blessed assurance to know that our sins are forgiven, that we are free indeed, and that we are a child of the King. The Holy Spirit also testifies that we can live a life above sin, a life without sin, through the power of the cross and through the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. So the Holy Spirit convicts, the Holy Spirit convinces. Third thing that I want us to see, the Holy Spirit counsels. The Holy Spirit counsels. John chapter 16, verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21 says, Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it read the story about a, a certain guide who lived in the Arabian desert. And you can understand that getting lost in a desert can be a, a life or death situation, right? And this guide decided that it would behoove him <laughs> to have some help. And so he found a pigeon honing pigeon that would be able to know wherever it is he goes home and he tied a little band to that pigeon and then tied it to his wrist and he would hold that pigeon and as he walked along he wasn't sure what direction to go he would just let the pigeon loose and the pigeon would start to fly in the direction that the guide needed to go home and he became known as the dove man because he had this bird that he would let go. And I, I don't know, it doesn't completely make sense. Like, well, wouldn't he be the pigeon man? I don't know. I just know the story was he became the, the dove man. And much like the pigeon helped him give direction, the Holy Spirit does that in our lives. Guides us into all truth. Helps us to know the truth, to discern the truth. Have you ever been saying and somebody is saying something and there's something inside you that just says, no, that's not, that's not right. That's not God's word. That's not, that's not from me. That's the Holy Spirit. That's discernment. Guiding us in truth. Helping us as we read God's word to understand truth but also just as we go through life directing us, helping us to see what we need to do, not do. There's temptation over here. Let's go this direction. 
That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. Tremendous gift that we've been given. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who comes in our lives, the moment of salvation. But working in our life even before salvation, convicting us of our sin, pointing us to the cross. John Wesley and Wesleyan theology, we, we call that prevenient grace, the grace that goes before, the grace that draws us to Christ. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So he convicts us before we're saved as well as after salvation when we step outside of the, the, the boundaries of God's law and design for humanity. He convinces us of God's truth. And then he guides us in that truth. I want to ask you three questions. Three questions that I hope that you will really reflect on, chew on. And be serious about. Because if you can't be truthful with yourself, it's probably not going to be a whole lot of help. The Holy Spirit is a great gift. But we have to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. First question. Is the Holy Spirit convicting you? Is the Holy Spirit convicting you? Is there something in your life that the Holy Spirit is saying, this is not right, this needs to change? And then follow up to that, what will you do about that? What will you do about that? Second question. Where is the Holy Spirit working to convince you For some, I think some of you may be struggling to truly believe that God would forgive you. You might be quick to say, God forgives, and to try to encourage somebody else. But you've bought in Satan's lie that says that your sin, for some reason, is not forgivable. And that though you've confessed it to the Lord, that God hasn't really forgiven you, that God's still holding that against you, that you're still ruined, you're still marked by that. And perhaps today would be the day that the Holy Spirit is able to break through in your life and convince you that he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That if we confess our sins, (laughs) that God is faithful and Justin will cleanse us, will purify us from all unrighteousness and that today will be the day that you become convinced of that and walk in the freedom that Christ has given you. So where is the Holy Spirit working to convince you? Third question. What next step is the Holy Spirit leading you to take? What next step is the Holy Spirit leading you to take? Um, in, the, in the teaching notes, I mentioned a couple other resources that can be helpful. Uh, one of them I shared a little bit more from last week called Forgotten to God by Francis Chan. It's a great read. It's a, it's a pretty uh, simple, easy to read, uh, very well written in my opinion. But Francis points out that some people, they, they want to know God's will for their life. How many of you want to know God's will for your life? I, like, I want to know God's will for my life. But we can get into the problem of wanting to know God's will for our life for like 20, 30, 40 years. And, and oftentimes, Francis suggests, and, and I think Scripture bears this out, and my experience would bear this out, oftentimes the Holy Spirit does not work in a way where he just... He says, here's your future the next 20, 30, 40 years. Jesus said in this passage that we've just read that the Holy Spirit will tell us about things to come. But here's what I believe and what I've seen and what Francis talks about in his book is that oftentimes it's that next step. Here's the next step. Here's what I have for you now. And we don't know what's the next step after the next step until we take the next step. 
And one of the things that I've learned in my life is that I'm tr- if I'm trying to focus on the next step after the next step and the next step after that, that's when I start to get tripped up in life. So I'm trying to get one foot in front of the other faster than I can do it or faster than it needs to be done. And I think there's a reason why the Apostle Paul tells us to walk in step, to keep in step with the Spirit. So what, what is your next step? What is the next step that the Holy Spirit is guiding you to take? As you reflect on those three questions, I'm going to invite Larry and Paul to come and lead us once again. And I may slide back. Do we have this ready to go, guys? Okay. Good deal. Thank you. Good deal. I don't have to work on that then. So those three questions, if you would just consider those as the guys get ready to lead us once again, let me pray for you, with you. So Lord Jesus, we're thankful we come in your name and your name alone, not in our own righteousness, because our own righteousness, apart from you, is like filthy rags. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are faithful, that where we need conviction, you convict You do your work. You do everything that you've been sent to do in our lives. You convict. It's on us to respond to that conviction. To agree to that conviction. To confess what you already know, that you're right. But for us to acknowledge it, for us to turn from that, convinced that going our own way is a road to damnation and eternal separation from you. And that by your grace, we have another option through the cross of Christ. That we would be convinced of that truth and convinced of the truth that comes with that truth. And may we submit to your guidance step by step step, as you counsel, as you guide, as you direct that you would be honored and glorified in all these things knowing that you work for our good and for your glory. And so we pray that you would be glorified above all. We pray this in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stand with me if you're able.